I will take you to the book of 1 Timothy and chapter number 6. We will be um, in this pericope. There's a, there's a passage here from verse 11 all the way to verse number 16 that I would like for us to focus on this morning. Um, 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse 11 through verse number 16. As we prepare to look at that text, uh, I want to read a few sentences, a few quotes that will kind of help our hearts to transition into this text, uh, will we'll set us up to what Paul is about to say to Timothy. I will read this. Um, some familiar, some maybe not familiar, but then just a few quotes that have been um, statements that have been made over the years that might be helpful in helping us think through this text, this passage. I will remind us to begin with of the words of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards once said, this is a prayer that he made, he once said, he said, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. That's a quote by Jonathan Edwards that, um, I don't know, just a branding tool. I don't know what they use to put tattoos on people's skin, but whatever tool that is, that God would use that to stamp eternity on your eyeballs. That's what Jonathan Edwards said. Um, John Wesley. John Wesley once said, he said, I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. I judge all things, not most things, not a lot of things, but he says, I judge all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. C.S. Lewis said this. C.S. Lewis said, if you read history you will find that the Christians who do the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. I will read that one more time. He says that if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. One common thread, one common theme that you see in these quotes is an encouragement, an exhortation for us to be focused on the next world, focused on the world to come. I went to these quotes because I strongly believe that the text we are about to consider together will be loaded by imperatives, it will be loaded by commands that only people who are futuristically focused will obey these commands. And the reason I say that is because Paul connects a future event to, the, to these imperatives. When you consider this, this passage, the, what we call this, this pericope, this, this thought, that Paul is delivering from verse 11 to verse 16. He connects it to a future event. That we must be futuristically focused as God's children to live in obedience to these commands or these imperatives that Paul gives. What is that future event? If you look at verse 14, you will see it. In verse number 14, Paul says that you keep this commandment without spot blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing. That future event is what we are talking about. He says, Timothy, you stay on this until Christ appears again. We, we believe in a visible return of Christ. We, we believe in a physical return of Christ, in a personal re re return of Christ. We, we believe in a triumphant return of Jesus Christ. And Paul is giving some commands, he's giving some imperatives in this passage, and he connects them to the return of Jesus Christ. And he says, you do this until Christ. So, so it means that the thought of the return of Christ must dominate your heart and your mind as you continue walking in obedience to these imperatives. 
So we will consider these imperatives together. We will consider the three imperatives that Paul gives in this small little passage, starting from verse number 11. Please, let's read this together. Allow me to read this. I am reading from the New King James Version, not because I don't preach out of the NASB. I do preach out of the NASB, but I just love the way Christ is described in verse 15 by the King James um, and for that reason, I just stuck to this. Uh, so please allow me, I, I kindly request. So from verse number 11 of chapter 6, Paul says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without sport, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing." which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we ask of your help. We ask that you will aid us in making sense of what you are saying to us this morning in this passage. We pray together with the men of old, and we say what we know not, teach us. What we are not, make us. Take your word and plant it deep in our hearts to transform us and cause us to grow in likeness to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So like I said at the beginning, that we are going to consider some three inspired imperatives, three inspired instructions that Paul gives to Timothy that I, I, we know for a fact is not just applicable to people who are in full-time ministry, even though Paul is writing to Timothy as a pastor in Ephesus. This is applicable to all of us who are believers, born-again children of God. And so we will consider these imperatives together. I'm not sure if the media team got the, uh, for the projection, the someone points. Do we have them up? No? No? Okay. I thought I would have needed that help because I don't speak American. I speak English. So uh, sometimes I will say words and you're wondering, what is he saying? You know, there will be times I will say things and they'll be clear. But uh, hopefully, you know, we will all make sense of this together. So the first um, inspired instruction that we find is in verse 11. In verse 11, we see that Paul is saying to Timothy, there's a course for him to engage. Course, C-O-U-R-S-E. There's a course for him to engage. This is what Paul says to Timothy. He says, but you, O man of God. He starts, he opens up his um, statement with, with an adversative. It's a negative conjunction. And when this negative conjunction is put together with that pronoun, you, Paul's goal is to draw sharp, striking, strong contrast. He wants to contrast Timothy with the people that Paul has been speaking about from verse 3 to verse 10. These are the false teachers. So Paul wants to draw some strong, striking, sharp contrast between Timothy and those guys, those false teachers. And so he employs the use of that adversative and he combines it with that pronoun so that he will draw that sharp contrast he is seeking to draw. He says, but you, O man of God. 
addresses Timothy with that phrase, a phrase of honor, a phrase that has been used to address some prophets in the Old Testament, including guys like Moses, man of God. In using that phrase, Paul is reminding Timothy that he belongs to God. He's reminding Timothy that he is representing God. He's reminding Timothy that Timothy is speaking for God. He belongs to him, he represents him, and he speaks for him. So he, he on purpose, will drop in that phrase to remind Timothy of these things. He says, but you, O man of God, you have, you have no message of your own. Any, I mean, I, I know for sure that Pastor Beck and Pastor Frank will agree with that. That, that as, as, a, as a pastor or a preacher, you have no right to edit God's message. God's message ought to be delivered, uninterfered with. It, it's, it's almost like copywritten material. There's a copyright. And, and you don't alter, you don't touch, you don't edit, you don't... No updates. In, in, in saying that, Paul is also reminding Timothy some of these things. God wants his message delivered as he gave it. I know there's usually temptation, even in a while today, we, we want to make God's message, we want to make the gospel palatable. We want to make it acceptable to people. And so there are details we might conceal, we will not give them, because we believe, we have just sung in Christ alone here. The Methodist Church rejected that song because of a phrase in that, where it says, the wrath of God was satisfied. They, they would not want to talk about God's wrath. They, they, they would want a phrase that is more acceptable, more socially um, appealing. And so I, I stand with the Gettys when they said, okay, then, then our song is not for your hymn book. And they stood their ground. So there are details about the gospel that are unattractive. I'm reminded of an Old Testament illustration where God told Moses, he said to Moses, I want you to build me an altar. When you build me an altar, I want you to take the stone and make sure the stones you use to build me an altar will not be touched by human tools. Don't chisel them. Because when you, when you take a chisel and you chisel away, you chip away the unwanted thing and, and make sure the stone is looking nice, aesthetically acceptable, then, then, then it becomes attractive to the people. God says, no, I want you to take those stones as crude and as raw and as unattractive and as ugly as they are, pile them up and make me an altar. And I will accept that sacrifice. So what God is saying is he does not need men's help. He doesn't need our help to make his message attractive to people. We have been delivered from the, the syndrome of trying to protect God. We, God has not called us to protect him. God has called us to proclaim him, not to protect him. He doesn't need our protection. God can protect himself. He doesn't need our protection. What we do is we just proclaim him. Proclaim him and watch him take his gospel and use it with his power to subdue the hearts of rebels and make them his children. And that's what God does. We have no message of our own. That's a reminder for us this morning. It's a reminder for Timothy. When Paul uses the phrase, man of God, he says, you belong to God, you represent God, and you speak for God. Not for yourself. So he says this. He says, but you, O man of God. Then he gives this first set of, of imperatives. He says, I want you to flee these things. Flee. Now, the word translated flee there, I don't know how many Hispanic speakers we have in the house this morning, but the, 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 there's a Spanish word, the word fuego. It means fire. Okay? This word almost sounds like fuego. It's the Greek word feugo. Feugo, that means, you know, when you even listen to it, when you hear it, it kind of sounds close to an English word that we're familiar with. The word fugitive. It's from this word that we get our English word fugitive. So what is Paul saying to Timothy? He's saying to Timothy, you must have the mindset of a fugitive 
when it comes to these things. He says, flee these things, run away from them like a fugitive would. You know, a fugitive who is running away from the authorities. He, he doesn't want the authorities to catch up with him. So he's, he's trying to flee. He's very strategic. There are places a fugitive will avoid because they put him most at risk. There are places he will avoid. And there are places he will strategically go because he knows these places will help him to hide. So Paul is telling Timothy, you must employ the mind of a fugitive when it comes to these things. Now, what are these things that Paul is talking about? Well, if you consider the immediate context, he has just been talking about false teachers. And he says the false teachers, they are worldly. The false teachers are materialistic. So Paul is asking Timothy to flee from worldliness and to flee from materialism. And he says you must do it with the mind of a fugitive. That's what Paul is saying. Now if you don't do it with the mind of a fugitive, you will fail. That's why Paul is very tactical and very technical in the language he uses. He says you must be very strategic. These are not things that are left to chance. You, you don't leave this to chance. If you leave this to chance, you have to be very intentional. If you leave this to chance, you will fail. You will become materialistic. You will become worldly just like the false teachers. He says that's not your potion, man of God. That's not what you've been called to. And, and the thing that will help us with this is when we remain futuristically focused and daily, we will have the mind of a fugitive. Daily, we will strategically seek to get away from worldliness and materialism. That you have structured your life in such a way that worldliness and materialism will not catch up with you. The mind of a fugitive running away, avoiding the high-risk areas. Because there are places you know. If you, if you make frequent visits, then you will become worldly and you will become materialistic just like pagans and heathens and people who do not know Christ. So you strategically stay away. Because you have a fugitive mindset. You don't want those things to catch up with you. So like Timothy, you are called to flee. So he says, you man of God, flee these things. And then he says to him, he says, as you flee, that's why we are saying this is a cause to engage. You're not just running from, you are also running to. He says, Flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. He says, you flee, you feugo these things, and then he says, you pursue. Now, like I said, Paul, by God's grace, God chose Paul to pen down enough books in the, old, in the New Testament because of Paul's, God used Paul's background. That when Paul needed to use accounting terms, he could use accounting terms to make something clear. When he needed to use military terms, he could use them. So Paul is very technical and very tactical with his language. Here, he uses the word translated pursue is a word that is also used to describe an animal on a hunt. When an animal is hunting down prey, you know how an animal, like a lion, will focus on a gazelle and say, that's my target. And he will run after it to catch it. That's the term that Paul uses here when he says pursue. He says you hunt these things down. You hunt them like an animal would hunt prey. He says you pursue righteousness. 
obviously, we, we do not have time to go through all this entire list. But, you know, the righteousness Paul is talking about here is, is not forensic righteousness. Like, when God saved you, when Jesus saved you, He declared you righteous. There was a declaration, a declaration of righteousness. That's what we call positional righteousness. It's forensic righteousness. You were declared righteous. Before Jesus saved you, you were an enemy of God, and, and, and you, were, you were hostile to the things of God. But once He saves you, then heaven declares you righteous. We stand righteous not because of our, any merit of our own. We're not righteous because we merit righteousness. We are righteous because Jesus saved us. And he declared us righteous, and he made us righteous. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. The righteousness we boast about is not our own. If you are here and you have not bent your knee to Christ, you are rebelling against the rule of God in your life opportunity to be made righteous is available. You can run to Jesus today. You can run to the cross today, and you can become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's, that's the forensic right. It's not native to ourselves. It's something that we have received. It's a foreign righteousness that we receive from God. So Paul is not talking about that righteousness here. He's not talking about the forensic righteousness. He's talking about functional righteousness. Now, this is where your life will match your lips. What you say, when you say, I am a Christian, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, when you say that with your lips, we will see that in your life. That is what Paul is saying here, that you are to pursue righteousness, you pursue living a life where it will be clear that what your lips say is what your life demonstrates. And he says you hunt that down like an animal is hunting prey. You pursue it with intent. He's asking you to be single-minded. He's asking you to be focused on this. Don't get distracted. And the only way for us not to get distracted is if we keep our mind on this future event, that Christ will appear. And so every day you wake up, and like a lion hunting down a gazelle, you are hunting down righteousness with intent, with focus, with single-mindedness. You are hunting it down. You will not get distracted because, my brother, my sister, we are in this world. Think about it. You live here for 80 years. That requires a single-mindedness that is exceptional for you not to lose, to, to be sidetracked. And that is what Paul is calling for here. He's asking us to engage this course where as fugitives, we are fleeing from worldliness. We are fleeing from materialism. But also as hunters, we are hunting down righteousness. This is the cause for us to engage. So he says, you pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love. Are you actively pursuing these things? Now notice that these verbs here are in the present tense. What does that mean? That means that this is supposed to be habitual, continual, non-stop. You do not pursue one week and then stop. You do not pursue for one year and then stop. You pursue, endlessly pursue, continually pursue. That this is, this is to be your life. Paul is saying this is your lifestyle. You are constantly running away and constantly running to. He, God, God puts it in the present tense intentionally to show us what we are signing up for. He saves you, 
This is your new life, O man of God. This is your new life. So we have a course to engage, but then not just that. Paul says again, we have a conflict to endure. A conflict to endure. That's what we see in verse number 12. In verse number 12. I, I mean, I wish we had time to go through the whole list. You know, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. You know, patience and gentleness. I love the way Paul just couples these things together. Patience and gentleness. You know, you can patiently wait for something without being gentle. Patience is not just about how long you wait, but it's how you behave as you wait. That, that, that there can be people who will wait for extended periods of time, but they don't wait gently. Patience, coupled together with gentleness. You wait, and you wait gently. Um, I, I, the, the truth is, the world is changing, and, and we are becoming more and more impatient. Um, but Paul is saying, you wake up as a believer, and daily you hunt down patience, like an animal hunting down prey. And you don't just want to be patient, you want to be gentle as you wait. It's, it's not being patient, and then grumbling and complaining as you wait. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. It is being patient, and as you are patient, we see expressions of gentleness. That's what Paul is talking about here. These things, they go hand in hand. So pursue these things as a predator would pursue a prey. Pursue them. So he says, no, the people who will have this fugitive mindset and they're running away from worldliness and they're running away from materialism and they are pursuing righteousness and love and godliness and patience and gentleness. These people, when you do that, you become, you attract the fury of hell. You, you become a target. Because you have chosen to swim against the current. That's what you have chosen. Essentially, when you engage this course, you have chosen to swim against the current. What should you expect? You should expect conflict. And that's what Paul says in verse 12. That in verse 12, he says, there's a conflict for us to endure. What does he say? He says in verse number 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. Make it personal. Grab it. Hold it. Eternal life. To which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul says we should expect a fight. So he says you fight. That's the verb there. Agonizomai. It's very clear as English speakers that, you know, the word agonize, clearly you can see it there. So to agonize, Paul is calling on us to engage an agonizing battle. So he says, fight the good fight of faith. Now this fight is called a good fight. There's an adjective there to qualify that now. It's the good fight. It's a good fight of faith. Why is it good? Because of what it will produce. What will it produce? It will produce Christ-likeness in us. We will become more and more like Jesus as we fight this fight. That is why the fight is called a good fight. Because of the end product that it will produce in us. It will make us more and more like Christ. More and more like Jesus. That's that heaven, you who is here, and you are redeemed and saved by Christ, heaven will not rest until you look like Christ. You will daily, daily engage in things that God has orchestrated to make you look like His Son. That's heaven's agenda for you right now. 
to make you look like Christ. And so there's, there's, that's what will qualify that adjective. The, it's, it's a good fight. It will produce Christ-likeness in you. This, this agony that you will have to bear has a good end as its objective. So you fight the good fight of faith. We have often said, um, when Jesus saves you, there's so many things, so many phrases and words the Bible uses to describe salvation. You say, you're born again. That's a phrase that describes redemption or salvation. Um, other places, Paul will say, you have been enlisted. Here, we are being called to fight the good fight. And, and so we say to people, listen, when God saves you, He doesn't beck on you or call you to come aboard a cruise ship. You're not being invited into a cruise ship. You've heard that phrase? You're not being invited to a cruise ship. You, know what a, you, you guys know what a cruise ship is. Where you go, I'm not sure where the Becks were. They were on vacation just recently. I'm not sure whether they went on a cruise ship. But, you know, when you go on a cruise ship, you go there to enjoy. You know, you just go to the open oceans and you sail the open seas. And you enjoy the skies. You enjoy the weather. You enjoy all that nature has to offer. But we are saying, when you got saved, you were not invited on board a cruise ship. You were invited on a battleship. Because God called you and beckoned you to come and do battle. To fight the good fight of faith. Now, remember again, this is not something you do once and stops. This is becoming, this is your life. Continually fight this good fight of faith. Fight. Um, your enemies have been identified. In Africa, I usually tell my people, I say, listen, your, your wife is not your enemy. Your husband is not your enemy. The Bible identifies who your enemy is. Who you battle against. You battle against your flesh. You battle against the secular systems of the world that are skewed to make you go farther and farther away from God. So there's a battle ensuing, and God is saying you are to fight. This conflict, you must endure this conflict. Daily fighting your flesh, daily fighting the secular systems of the world, and daily fighting Satan, who is the enemy of your soul. So we have been called into a conflict, and we endure this conflict. We fight it to the end. It is a good conflict, my brother, my sister. It is a good conflict because what it will do is it will make you look more and more like Christ daily. You are growing in your Christ-likeness daily. You are talking less and less like the world and talking more and more like the saints. You are loving more and more the things the saints love. And you hate the things the world loves. It would be a big problem if you confess to be a believer. And what happens is your affections do not change. Your affections remain the same. That your affection for the Word of God does not grow. Your affection for Christ doesn't grow. Your affection for the saints doesn't grow. That would be a red flag. But as you fight this good fight of faith, my brother, my sister, your affection for Jesus grows. Your affection for His Word grows. Your affection for the saints grows. You know, that if you're looking for evidence that you have been redeemed, you have been saved, that's it. The measure of your affection for Jesus grows. The measure of your affection for His Word grows. The measure of your affection for His people grows as you fight the good fight of faith. I love the fact that Paul reminds us of just this dynamic that has always brought tension about our salvation. Look at what he says here. He says, You lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called 
the word translated called there is, is in, the, in the passive voice. Somebody did this for you. Somebody did this to you. You received this action. So when it comes to salvation, the tension has always been between God's sovereignty in salvation and man's responsibility in salvation. And we see both of them here. It says, Paul, I mean, Timothy was called to eternal life and he confessed the good confession in the presence. So there was a call and there was a confession. And both of them are there. That when God calls you, the effectual call of God, there could be even someone here, maybe you are not saved. You have not been redeemed. But God calls you today, you will not say no. It's an effectual call. And then there will be some corresponding action. You will confess it. And what will you say? You will say, Jesus is Lord. And we see both of them there. And it's just a beautiful thing. We have not, n- nobody is able to reconcile those two things. But it's true because the Bible teaches both those two things. Um, the closest I've ever come when I talk to my students in Africa is I say, listen, we have uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. It's a mighty, huge mountain. Um, the only places in Africa where you get to see snow is, uh, is on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro and on top of Mount Kenya. So when you go to the Kilimanjaro, mostly the clouds will hide uh, the top of the mountain, the apex of the mountain. You won't see it. So when the clouds clear, it's a spectacle. Everybody comes out and they want to see it. But usually the clouds will keep you from seeing the top. Now we see a side go up this way and we see another side go up that way. And then the clouds do not, they, they prevent us from seeing where they meet. We see the truth of God's sovereignty in our salvation, and we see man's responsibility, but we don't know where these two things meet. And we are satisfied with that because that's what the Bible, the Bible teaches God is sovereign over salvation. When he calls you, you cannot say no. It's an effectual call. It's it's not a call that is taking chances. But again, Man is responsible. How do we reconcile these two things? We cannot, but we know them to be true. And we preach them with all of our hearts because we know the Bible teaches them. So anyway, Paul drops in those two details that just help us rejoice in our salvation again as he reminds Timothy of that reality. So we have a cause to engage, we have a conflict to endure, and then lastly what Paul says is, he tells Timothy he has a charge to execute. He has a charge to execute. Now, if you look at verse 13, all the way through verse 16, Paul says, I charge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this commandment without sport, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. And then Paul says, Amen. Or maybe he's hoping, because of what he has said, anybody who reads this letter will respond and say, Amen. That it will provoke that in you. So Paul gives a charge that he expects Timothy to execute. Now, he he gives a directive. I think that's what we will see clearly from verse 13 to verse 15a. And then he gives a doxology from verse 15b to verse 16. He gives a directive and then gives a doxology. Um, My daughter, um, at some point in her life, kind of also struggled. She struggled with questions people struggle with, usually. Like, uh, why did God decide to give me black eyes? 
Why not blue eyes? God decided to give me black eyes. You know, there are things God decides and he doesn't invite human opinion. <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he has sovereign space where human input is not invited. Yeah. He decides who will be born in Texas, the elect, okay? Um, and <laughs> no, no, forget I said that. So he decides who will be born in Texas, who will be born in Florida, who will be born in New York, who will be born in California. He decides who will be born in Mexico, who will be born in South America, North America, Africa, Europe, Australia, Asia. God decides that without inviting human opinion. He decides what family you will be born in. He doesn't, he doesn't invite your opinion there. He doesn't say, who do you like? Who would you rather be your father? God decides that. And so there was a time my daughter was struggling with, uh, with that. And uh, so you have to walk your children through some of those things. Just recently, I had to go and spend some time with my son uh, because, you know, God would call on parents to help their children navigate the ebbs and flows of life and help them because hopefully you know better than they do and you can guide them through those seasons. So she was asking a ton of questions. I'm just glad she did not ask, why was I given you guys as parents? So <laughs> or maybe she thought it, I don't know, but she didn't ask it. So anyway, so she was asking a ton of questions just about that. And we talked about the sovereign space that God does not invite human opinion. So I, I, we ended up, to cut the long story short, we ended up saying, what do you do when you have a problem with God's actions? You have a problem with God's actions. There's something God has done. He has acted in a way you don't understand. Your human mind cannot make sense of it. What do you do? And the safest answer I could give my daughter is this. When God acts in a way that you do not understand and you cannot make sense of, you have his attributes to fall back on. So when his actions don't make sense, meditate on his attributes. What do you know to be true of God? So, so he has done something that probably your mind is struggling with. But what do you know to be true of him? Because, you know, many a times we question, think about it. When my daughter was asking those questions, it's because she thought she could do something better than God. She, she thought in a way she had, she had some greater sense of wisdom. Okay? That why did God do this? Why not the other? She thought this other one is a better idea than the idea God had. And so we think like we can improve on God's actions and ideas. But when you think about his attributes. They will humble you. They will cause you to fall prostrate and worship, and they will put an end to your questions. When you think about his wisdom in comparison to your wisdom, his wisdom that stretches beyond the skies, his, 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 his love that is boundless, depth and width, and height, and length that cannot be measured, and you begin to meditate on that, they will dissolve your questions. So when his actions do not make sense to us, we fall back on his attributes, and our souls will find a quietness when we constantly meditate on his attributes. Because you think about his wisdom, and then you say, honestly... How can I improve on that? I cannot improve on that. I will find rest in that. Even though it doesn't make sense to my mind, I will trust that infinite wisdom. That's kind of what Paul does here as he comes to a close. He, he gives a directive and then he gives a doxology to exalt Jesus. And I think this doxology empowers you and empowers me, empowered Timothy to obedience. When we think about the majesty of Jesus, then we are empowered to obey him. And that's what Paul does. He, he, he talks about Jesus being 
totally in authority, and then he talks about Jesus being transcendent. Jesus is in total, he has total authority, and he is transcendent. And for that reason, you can execute this charge, Timothy. You can do it. Why? Because of the majesty and the glory of the one who has called you. So what does he do? He says, he says this. He says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. Where is Mr. Darwin to read that verse? Where is he? God gives life to all things. So we believe in creationism. Um, you know, there was a time when evolution was a fast, wild problem. You know, we have third wild problems and then we have fast, wild problems. Evolution was a fast, wild problem. Because in the fast world, people questioned the origin of all we see. And so it, it, it became, for whatever reason, evolution became very popular. And it's, it's just one of those most sense. I don't know whether, should we call it a theory or should we call it a hypothesis here at this point? Evolution that has taken over the Western world um, is, is the most senseless proposal for the existence of all we see. Because how, and, and, and unfortunately, the most brilliant minds propagate it and campaign for it. People have a problem with God. It's not because of intellectual inadequacies. That's not the reason. It, it's just a vileness. So we've always said it's not a mental problem, it's a moral problem. So they, they, they will question. And, and we, the Bible says, in thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's what the Bible says. Human wisdom exalted above biblical wisdom. And so that's, that's how evolution is promoted. Where you say, nobody plus nothing equals everything. That's the equation. That nobody plus nothing equals everything we see. And yet, it's the most, what, what we would consider in society, the most intellectually apt people that propose that. And we say it's the most ridiculous explanation to existence. We believe in what Paul says here. He says God gives life to all things. He doesn't just preserve things. He is the source of all things. And he reminds Timothy that as he gives him this charge. He says, I charge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. This good confession is when Pilate, he poses the question to Jesus. And he says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, it is as you have said. In saying that Jesus is confirming to the religious leaders that he is the Messiah. And in claiming that, by implication, he is deity. And that puts Pilate, puts Jesus in the wrong place with Pilate. It puts Jesus in the wrong place with the crowds and even with the religious leaders. And so sets him up to be crucified. Jesus confirming that he's the Messiah, he confirms he is the judge because the Messiah will judge all humanity. So Paul is just saying there's an accountability that must be given and he's trying to remind Timothy of that accountability. And he says, I charge you before God who gives, to, who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, without blemish, Without, with, uh, without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ return, which he, mani he will manifest in his own time, he who is blessed and only potentate. That's the word I love. I love the way King James uses that word, potentate. Uh, he's the only sovereign. Any authority that might be exercised on this world is either donated or delegated. The one who is totally in authority is one 
Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, he has total authority. Any other authority has been delegated. And any other authority must answer to him. And then Paul goes ahead to give all these titles for Christ that just demonstrate he is in total authority. He's the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. When, when Paul says Jesus has immortality, he, he doesn't mean life after death or, or, or that, that you come alive after you die. It means freedom from death. It, it, he's talking about some transcendent existence. How, how do we explain eternality, that God is eternal? These are the things you should meditate upon and they, they energize you to obey Jesus. He is eternal. I have met some systematic theologies where the writer, I think it's Grudem, uh, no, I, no, I think it's uh, Charles Ryrie, who tries to explain eternality. And he says, in one indivisible present, God extends endlessly backwards and extends endlessly forward in one indivisible present. <laughs> that is just man's way of, of saying something that will me it will just leave your mind stretched. And you go like, how do we explain such a one? We have no other response but to fall before him and worship him. Because this is majesty, eternality. He is transcendent. He dwells in unapproachable light. And he possesses immortality. Death cannot touch him. He is life and the source of it. That's Jesus. This doxology empowers us to obey the directive. So that when Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all, and in the presence of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, when he says that, we say, I am ready to obey that charge because I have seen the majesty of Jesus. He is transcendent. He is immortal. He is the source and sustainer of life. Why would we not obey such a one? Jesus demands for your worship. He demands that you worship him. What you will rejoice is to discover he actually deserves your worship. He deserves to be worshipped. And we think about what Paul says here and we say yes. And we think about his return and we are futuristic focus. The future fuels us for obedience. We are fueled by the future. That's the title of our message. When we think about Christ and his return, I say, yes, I want to engage this course. I want to endure this conflict. I want to execute this charge because Christ will come again. And daily, this becomes my life. I'm not just doing this for one week or for one year or for 10 years. I will do this until Christ returns. Until he comes, I will obey these imperatives because his return is on my mind. It dominates my heart. It dominates my mind. I daily think about it. Every week, every day, every week, every month, every year, I'm thinking about Christ's return. And so I will feugo worldliness and materialism. And I will hunt down patience and gentleness. I will do it because I'm constantly thinking about Christ and his return. To his glory and by his grace, we will do it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we need your help. This is an impossible mission if you do not come to our aid. You have reminded us it is you who works in us both to will and to do your good pleasure. 
Father, we pray that the coming of Christ will dominate our hearts and our minds. And for that reason, we will engage this course with joy. We will endure this conflict with gladness. We will execute this charge that you have given to us in your word. That we will stand before Christ blameless, without sport, because his return fueled us for obedience. We thank you for this church. Thank you for the pastors here. Thank you for the leaders and the members. We ask of your blessings upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.